There is hope. I know there is hope, not just for myself, but for all of us. Tonight you will hear my story. The one thing I am most proud of throughout it all is that I did not lose my hope. I, have, I kept my faith that there was a way out. As a young girl, I was very happy. I had a happy life, and there was no reason not to be happy. I loved everyone, and I was very carefree, as a childhood should be. Some of my most favorite memories were making up silly imaginative, imaginative games with my best friend and laughing endlessly. As the youngest of three children, I had two older siblings to learn from and look up to. And although I had a sister, I was filled with admiration for my older brother. All I wanted as a young girl was to be like Bensi. I would try to impress him and his friends in the hopes that they would include me. I would follow him around, tell him jokes, play ball, climb trees, monkey bars, and do anything so they wouldn't think I was too girly. Nobody thought I was too girly. I was the ultimate tomboy. But he was my big brother, and I loved him and wanted his approval. But then things changed. At first, I froze. I had no idea what to do. I was not used to arguing against Spency. I thought I needed his love, but this didn't seem normal. Brothers and sisters don't do this. We don't touch each other over here. I tried to wiggle away. He was bigger, he was stronger. I couldn't escape. There were some times that I tried to fight back. I cried. I cried, I begged, I pleaded, but he told me that if I ever told anyone, he would tell them that I'm lying and I'm crazy. And so I believed him. After all, he was my big brother. He knew what he was talking about. Once the abuse started, it was like a light was shut off and in its place was darkness. My entire disposition changed. I was extremely anxious and scared. What does a child do with a secret so large? What does a little girl do when her safe haven, her home, becomes the place of her very worst nightmare? I could no longer sleep peacefully at night without the fear of him intruding. And this fear was real. I was living a life of constant terror. I became withdrawn and could no longer share freely with others. I had a guard up, one of shame and fear. The love that I had for everyone turned into anger. I no longer brought sunshine into others' lives, but instead I bring rage and animosity. I had no idea what to do with all these unknown emotions and ideas. I remember that I would see my brother and just start hitting him. And he would whisper to me, see, now if you tell them, they definitely won't believe you. They know you're crazy. And that would only make me more and more upset. In school, I turned into the class clown, the jokester. I thought if anyone ever finds out my secret, they will think I'm disgusting, and no one will ever like me or want to be my friend. For years, I was ashamed and anxious. I never thought I could be accepted for who I truly was. I always felt like I was standing on the outside and alone. And while I can stand tall and say I'm a survivor, and I would not trade my past for an easier one, I still feel the shame of incest today. I have found my place, and I have friends. But I wonder, as I stand here speaking, in front of people who have come specifically to sur support survivors like me, will they still accept me after knowing all this about me? It's not easy to let go of the shame. I just need to remember that I did nothing wrong and to walk through these feelings until I find courage at the other end. When I was little, I couldn't tell my parents because I didn't think they would believe me. He said he would tell everyone I was crazy and he, he knew everything. But I also knew how wrong it was what he was doing, and I didn't want to hurt them. In my young mind, I couldn't see how much it was destroying me, and I didn't want my parents in pain from the actions of their children. But they saw how my behavior was deteriorating, and they took me to see a psychologist, not just one, but a few. And they all tried to talk to me, but none of the psychologists asked me if I was being sexually abused. None of them asked me if anyone ever touched me inappropriately. Now, as an educated adult, I know that I displayed all the signs of a traumatized and abused child, and I wonder why no one asked. Did they assume that it was impossible because I came from a good family? I felt worthless, like I didn't matter. I will never know what happened, and I can only hope to do better by our children today. From when the abuse stopped at age 11 until the age of 20, 21 for 10 years, I completely blocked it out, or so I thought. 
I was living with the effects of it, but I refused to look it in the eye and acknowledge that my brother had sexually abused me until a therapist asked me if I was abused. The first time, I adamantly said no. But in my head, I was thinking, yes, yes you were. He hurt you so many times and it counts. Just say yes. The next session, I admitted to it, like as if it was some kind of sin. But even after that, it took, my, it took time to get myself the help I so badly needed. I kept saying it didn't really count. He was my brother. But of course it counts. Incest is horrible. I would t tell myself that I was exaggerating the memories when truthfully I'd repressed so many of them. But when I finally got therapy and started talking about it, it was, letting an, it was like letting an old wound that was covered up by a grimy Band-Aid for too long air out and heal. Many of you may be wondering, isn't this a family matter? Shouldn't it be resolved within the family? But abuse is never a family matter. How can we resolve the problem where it took place and was silenced for so long? We need an objective person to help clear the dysfunction. It is our responsibility as a community to help every child, whether they are being abused by a relative, an acquaintance, or a stranger. But the more vulnerable the child, the more help they will need. For many years, I was always troubled by the thought that my brother would be hurting and abusing someone else. And I felt responsible. I always felt this duty to do something. At first, I was told that I must focus on my own healing first before saying something, unless I heard or, some, or saw something specific. But then, about 15 months ago, I had a very disturbing email conversation with him. It left me shaking. I called up Ellie Nash and told him what happened. He did a wonderful job empowering me through what I later found out was a lot of anger. A few minutes later, Mayor Sewald called me, and he too empowered me. We spoke of the options that Ellie brought up, but I was so afraid of my brother that night, I could barely consider what they had mentioned. About a week later, I called Mayor back, and I told him that after a lot of consideration, I wanted him to help me confront my brother. I wanted to make sure that he was no longer abusing anyone. I wanted to make sure that his children, my nieces and nephew, were safe. But as I told Mayor, and I specified in an email later that day, if he was not deemed to be a threat, I did not want his wife, my sister-in-law, to know what he had done to me as a child. They have a good marriage, and I didn't want to ruin it. All I wanted was for him to get the help he need, undergo, undergo the proper evaluations, and then to tell my parents. I didn't want my sister to know either. I didn't want money, I didn't even want an apology. I just wanted the assurance that children will be safe around him. So Mayor called my brother, and to his credit, he willingly admitted to what he had done Im immediately. He agreed to the conditions I had set forth and to meet with the professionals that Mayor had mentioned. I was in disbelief. For the first time in my life, I felt validated. I remember saying, like, so wow, like I didn't make this all up. It really happened. But his willingness to work with us was short-lived. He didn't show up to his first appointment. Shortly afterwards, Mayor received a phone call from a rabbi that my sister contacted, asking him to get involved. My lies were destroying the family. Mayor attempted to speak with my sister. She hung up on him. Ellie attempted to speak with my father. He hung up on him. Mayor warned my sister that if she doesn't fix things within a certain amount of time, he will call my sister-in-law's parents. And again, she hung up on him. So he called my brother's in-laws, who refused to listen to what they considered Lush and Hara, information that could have been protecting their grandchildren. At some point, my sister came around and says she agrees that I might, must have been abused, but it definitely couldn't have been Bensie. It must have been the nanny's husband. Back in Cleveland, I had heard that my brother's Rebbe was coming to visit. So I asked Rebbe Binyamin Blau, Rebbe Blau, who we just heard from son, the Rav of Green Road Synagogue in Cleveland, if he would come with me to speak to this Rebbe. As the Rebbe doesn't see women alone, and I wanted an advocate, he agreed. When I called to make an appointment, the Gabbai said to me, ah, so you're Ben Sion's sister. When I got there, the host, whom I had never spoken to about my situation, said the Rebbe and the Gabbai were on the phone with my brother during the day. When the meeting started, Rabbi Blau explained the situation. The Rebbe's first comment was, but new, so if it happened so long ago, why can't you just get over it? 
So Rabbi Blau explained the psychological effects of child sexual abuse. He explained that I wanted my brother to tell my parents so that they will believe that it happened. But the Rebbe didn't understand why I needed to punish my brother, so to speak, for all of this. I said that he agreed to these conditions. I just want to make sure that his kids are safe. He admitted to it. Can, can the Rebbe please ask him to work with us again? And the Rebbe said, but what if he denies it? I said, he already admitted to it, though. So, you're, so just say that you know that it's true and continue the conversation. The Rebbe said, but how do I know that you're telling the truth? And then he went on to tell me that I have an obligation to support my brother right now, my abuser, because he's obviously scared. I need to show him that there's nothing to be scared of and that I will never expose him. At that moment, I realized that this was not going to work. He was not going to help me. He was not going to tell my brother to do the right thing. He didn't believe me at all. I was frustrated, it hurt. But what eased the pain was knowing that I had my rabbi, an advocate, sitting right next to me, someone who believed me. Rabbi Blau defended me to this rabbi over and over, and that was what I needed. Nothing the rabbi said to me could break through my armor that night. And unsurprisingly, he did nothing. Nothing resulted from that meeting. At some point, I realized that my parents knew, even though I never mentioned anything to them. And while Family is supposed to be our safe haven. Very often, it's the place where we find our deepest heartache. My parents sadly refused to believe me. They claimed I was lying. I was hurting so deeply. I just wanted them to say they loved me and that everything was going to be okay. But all it seemed like they were doing was placing more value on him than on me. I begged them to believe me. I cried to them and I said, why would I ever make up a story like this about my own brother? I love him. I love his beautiful family. And they told me to prove this by dropping this whole thing. But even as I stand here tonight speaking to you, I can say that I love him. He's my brother, and that's what makes this, makes this so difficult. There's so many conflicting thoughts, so many mixed emotions. I want to heal, yet I want to protect him. Then again, he never protected me. But I need to protect his children. I love them so much. I'm their aunt. And so it goes back and forth, over and over. And so I met with Rabbi Blau again, asking for help with my parents. How can I get them to understand me and believe me? He told me I first need to understand human nature and understand why incest is so complex. They've been loving parents to me for so many years. They've done more for me than most parents would do. And, have, and I am incredibly grateful for that. After my divorce, they took me and my son in, and we live under their roof, and they provide for us above and beyond what normal parents would do, all so that I can go back to school and finish my degree. They give my son the world, much like they gave us, but they're parents, and they're just now, nearly two decades later, hearing that their son, who they thought was perfect, did this, their only son. He did these horrible things to their daughter. It's too difficult for them to accept. It's simply too much for them to handle. And so we need to work from that perspective. In my pain, I never saw things from their side. And it has tr helped me tremendously to understand it like that. So Rabbi Blau suggested that we all go to see a therapist, someone neutral. Everyone will tell their side. My brother will tell his side. I'll tell my side. And afterwards, the therapist will talk to my parents. So he gave me some references. But when I brought it up, they flat out refused to go. I cried to my parents, begging them to care, pleading with them to believe me. But then I realized I didn't want to beg anymore for their trust. I just wanted to have peace and to stop feeling like I was less than. And that was when I decided to stop fighting a battle that couldn't be won and to focus, more on, to focus instead on a more important task, to find peace within myself. That way, whether or not I have their belief and acceptance won't be relevant anymore. So at this point, I'd like to make mention that so often when discussing child sexual abuse, we hear about the rabbis and leaders who either abused or stayed silent or didn't do the right thing. But as you have heard tonight, I think it is appropriate to give a tremendous hakarat hatov to Rabbi Yosef Blau of YU and Rabbi Binyamin Blau of Green Road Synagogue in Cleveland for their unwavering support and advocacy. <laughs> Thank you.
They both have helped me to get to the place I am today, and I must acknowledge that. I can only hope that more communities are blessed with leaders like this. So when we are unable to change a situation, the challenge is then to transform ourselves. I could not change my family. I could not force them to believe me and accept what I was saying. But that did not mean I had to be miserable. I was determined to live the best possible life, regardless of how it started out. So I grieved. I mourned over my lost childhood. I cried and I asked all the questions. I wanted to know why he chose me to abuse, why he didn't love me enough to protect me like a big brother should. I explored why I had an unsupportive family. I wrote a lot. And I'm very fortunate that I had some very good friends who listened and validated my grief. In grieving, I acknowledged the loss I had faced and was facing. I read and absorbed all there was to know about child sexual, sexual abuse and post-traumatic stress disorder. I wanted to understand everything that was stolen from me, how it affected me, and how to heal. And so I continued writing, all the while working very hard in therapy. And then a wonderful thing happened. I stopped blaming myself. I don't know exactly when that happened, but it was like that light switched back on. I stopped blaming myself, and I was able to finally see what happened to me was not my shame to bear, and it, that I was worthy of love. I could do good, and I will live a meaningful life. I began to sh find joy again in living. My passion for writing seemed to extend to photography, nature, sports, the orchestra, and simply being an active part of society and my community. I began to speak more freely of my past. I joined a support group and would look forward to the weekly meetings. Until then, I thought incest was far and few between. But in the group, four out of six members were sexually abused by a father or a brother. So we cried together and we laughed together, but for the first time we weren't alone. And then finally I was able to stand up and tell a crowd of 200 people in my hometown of Cleveland that I was a survivor. I realized that I had a un unique opportunity to be an advocate for my community. I no longer had a secret. I had a story, and I wanted to share it with others. Perhaps this cannot be fixed, but I can carry it with pride and meaning. Maybe I will help someone else, like all those who helped me along the way. As I stand here today, I wish I could tell you it gets better, but it doesn't. Child sexual abuse will always be devastating. It will always be painful, and it should be but you will get better and you will learn to cope with the pain and devastation and you will be able to lead a healthy life because you can get better, I promise. I do not want to fix my woundedness. I want to share it with the world. There are gifts in my wound, but when th something breaks, it's not the actual break that prevents it from getting back together. It's because the little piece gets lost and the two remaining ends can't fit together anymore even if they wanted to because the whole shape has changed. That's the way people are after trauma. We can't, we've changed, we can't go back to the way we were before, but we can build ourselves to become better than we ever were before. My message to parents is quite humbling, as I am speaking as a mother myself. Every home is at risk of incest. No home is immune to the dangers of incest. Incest is unfortunately too common. For years I thought it was just me and that no one else's brother sexually abused them the way mine did. And now I see that unfortunately I'm wrong. I have a large network of friends thanks to JCW, who are also survivors. And most of them are survivors of incest. Some were, of them were abused by brothers, fathers, sisters, mothers, grandfathers, the list goes on. And none of them have family support. Incest is like being sworn to secrecy for life, for someone else's crime, and the punishment for speaking out is losing one's family. But it's time to end this, please. I beg you, be aware of what is happening in your homes. It can be happening in any home. Speak to your children, educate them. If any one of your precious children comes to you and discloses abuse by another family member, tell them you believe them. You will never have another chance to make that lasting first impression and then help them. You can help both the abuser and the victim and love them both. I know it hurts, I've been there. For years I thought I had to love my brother and I couldn't love myself. So I kept quiet, but the greatest way to love an abuser is to get them the help they need. So call a professional, and don't let your child doubt your love and support for them. You're their parent, their champion, their advocate. It's not enough to be comp compassionate. You must act. To my fellow survivors of incest, I would like to tell you how brave you are. 
You have made it up until this point, carrying a huge burden on your shoulders, believing in yourself and all that you are. Know that there is something inside of you that is greater than any obstacle. Continue to share your heart with people even after it's been broken. Let yourself heal, and we are here for you whenever you are ready to talk. You are not alone anymore. And to my dear parents, I love you. I am sorry. I know my speaking here tonight and airing all these details is painful for you, but this had to be done. You are wonder wonderful parents and grandparents to Mendel and I. You have taught us and shown us the correct way for our entire lives and have been parents and role models we could be proud of. I hold no grievances toward you, and I know that you always did the best that you could. In the words of Viktor Frankl, the one thing that you can never take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you did to me. The last of one's freedoms is the ability to choose one's attitude in any given circumstances. So Bensi, I want to thank you for never being there in this past year and a half. When we started this journey, I never would have imagined getting up and publicly sharing my story. Your absence has forced me to find my own way and to be stronger than I ever could have dreamed. There were times when I had to stand alone in my family, but I had hope because I wasn't truly alone. Jewish Community Watch had my back. They gave me the push to keep trying when I thought we had exhausted all options. And that's how I know there is hope for all of us, because Jewish Community Watch exists, and we matter. Our pain is important, and healing from the devastation of child sexual abuse is of the greatest importance to many people. There's hope because you and I have value.